All right, it's time for lecture number nine. Today, we'll discuss Congress. There are a few things that you should be able to do at the end of this presentation. You should be able to compare and contrast the House and Senate in terms of the qualifications for serving in each of those chambers, their constitutional powers, the leadership in each of those, uh, how they're organized. And then you want to be able to evaluate of these two, which do you believe to be the most powerful? Congress works in the building shown in the upper left, the United States Capitol. I have to say, it's one of the most amazing places I have ever been in the United States. If you've never toured the Capitol, I strongly encourage you to do so. I was lucky enough to do so a couple times, and you can see a photo of me and my wife at the bottom of the screen. The first topic we'll explore will be qualifications for serving in both the House and the Senate. The Constitution identifies several qualifications, and what we'll do is we'll fill in this chart as we go along. The Constitution identifies a minimum age for serving in both chambers. It's 25 years old for the House and 30 for the Senate. One must also be a citizen to be a member of the House or the Senate. For the House, it's at least seven years, and for the Senate, it's at least nine years. Now, I'd like to point something out. You don't have to be a citizen from birth in order to serve in the House or the Senate. In the upper left-hand corner here, you see a photo of Pete Hoekstra. He was the congressman from West Michigan. Um, he was my congressman for many years. He was actually born in the Netherlands, and he became an American citizen over the years, and he eventually served for 18 years in the House of Representatives. In the upper right, you see Jennifer Granholm. Now, she was the governor of Michigan, but she was born in Vancouver, BC, in Canada. And then, of course, the bottom right, we see the governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who was born in Austria, but he became an American citizen, and he served as governor of California. There's also a residency requirement outlined by the Constitution. It's actually the same for the House and the Senate. However, based upon tradition in the House of Representatives, those reps generally live in the district that they are representing, but it's not required by the Constitution. I've shown this map a couple of times. Um, West Shore Community College is located in Michigan's second congressional district. Okay? It's not required that a representative live in his or her district, uh, but usually they know the strengths, the weaknesses, they know the people there, and so uh, uh, based upon tradition, um, usually people live in those districts that they're representing. The Constitution also requires that the number of House members is based upon each state's population. Every state gets at least one, but today, um, and then others are added based upon uh, the number of people who live there. And today it's one for about every 700,000 people. For the Senate, there are two senators per state. Here are some additional criteria. The Constitution requires that House members have a term length of two years. It's six years for the Senate. While the total number of House members is not set by the Constitution, for the last hundred years or so, the total number of members of the House of Representatives has been 435. And with two senators from every state, and with 50 states, today we have 100 senators. Next, I'd like to explore the constitutional powers of the House and the Senate. The Constitution gives special powers to each chamber. In many ways, the House of Representatives has the authority to initiate several things. First of all, the House of Representatives initiates all tax bills. Every single time there's a tax increase or tax cut, it must start, that bill must start in the House. Based upon tradition, all spending bills 
initiate are initiated in the house, whether it's on defense, education, whatever it may be. And then also just to, as a little review, the House of Representatives initiates the removal process because the House has the sole power of impeachment. The Senate also has special powers and authority. In many ways, the Senate has the final say on several things. For example, the Senate has the authority to either approve or to reject major nominations made by the president, whether it's his advisors or uh, maybe um, members of the judiciary, something like that. The Senate also has the authority to either ratify or to reject a treaty, and treaties are negotiated by the president. Finally, the Senate has the final say when it comes to removing someone who's been impeached, because if someone's been impeached, the Senate then acts as a jury in the removal trial. Next, we'll explore leadership in Congress. However, before we do that, uh, we'll explore a key concept that shapes leadership and how Congress operates. The key concept that drives much of what happens in Congress would be this, uh, this idea of the majority party. Now, of course, if the party that has more members in it, it's easier for them to pass the legislation. However, there are other factors that influence this idea. Uh, first of all, um, the majority party is able to put people in the, the most powerful positions. They also are able to put people in the chairs of the most powerful positions. So this idea really is important, and they choose all of these powerful leaders. Right now, in the House of Representatives, the Republican Party has a majority. Right now, in the U.S. Senate, the Democrats have a majority. And Joe Biden, who's the president, is a Democrat. So what we have right now is called divided government. For the first two years of the Biden administration, Democrats controlled the House, the Senate, and the White House. That's why they were able to uh, pass a lot of stuff through Congress. But it's going to be more difficult now, and Democrats and Republicans are going to have to work together in order to accomplish a lot of their goals. So let's explore some of those leadership positions and some of the leaders themselves. We will begin with the House of Representatives. The top leadership position, the most powerful person in the House, is the Speaker of the House. There are a few traits to consider when exploring the Speaker of the House. First of all, a person gets to be the Speaker by a vote for, of all of the House members. It's always a member of the majority party, and they get together and they vote for their leader, and so um, that's how you get to be the Speaker of the House, by a vote of the members of your party. Next, the Speaker has a lot of authority over debate and the calendar. The Speaker can actually determine which bills come up for discussion and debate to begin with. Now, while this is an awful lot of power and authority that the Speaker has, based upon tradition, the Speaker does allow opposing bills to be introduced. And the Speaker also um, often doesn't vote in uh, a symbolic gesture demonstrating the nonpartisan nature of the speaker position. Here is the door to the speaker's office. It's actually located right in the middle of the Capitol, uh, right off of the Capitol Rotunda. I had hoped to view uh, the speaker's office, but it was closed that day. So I guess I have another excuse to get to Washington, D.C. and do the tour. So I like to provide a bit of a profile of the people in these leadership positions. And the first would be this Speaker of the House. Um, earlier this year, uh, Kevin McCarthy, shown here, was chosen to be the new Speaker of the House by the Republicans. The Republicans just took over uh, the a majority in the House of Representatives. And it took several ballots for him to win the election, which was, which was unique. Um, and he served as the Speaker of the House until early October. But then... For the first time in American history, uh, the speaker was voted out of office by the members of his party. Uh, so this was very unique. Uh, so Kevin McCarthy was removed in early October 2023. So after three weeks of not having an, a speaker, the Republicans got together again after some other candidates um, dropped out, and they chose the gentleman shown here, Mike Johnson. He's a Republican from the state of Louisiana. He was 
first elected in 2016, so he hasn't been in office for very long. And he's probably the least experienced speaker that we've had in well over 100 years. However, he does have a background as a constitutional lawyer. Um, he also served in the Louisiana state uh, representatives. He was a, a Louisiana state representative. He's got a bachelor's degree and a law degree from Louisiana State University, and his bachelor's is in business and his law degree. Well, he focused on constitutional law. He's described himself as an evangelical Christian. Um, he was also a really strong supporter of President Trump. Uh, and when President Trump was put on trial after his impeachment, uh, Johnson was one of the leaders of his defense. And so um, it will be very interesting to see uh, how uh, Mr. Johnson does. Uh, and um, I, I don't know, it's just there's been a lot of um, new things that are happening uh, in Congress uh, this session. So the speaker is the top position in the House of Representatives. The second most powerful position would be majority leader. Here's a one sentence definition of what the majority leader does. It's leader of the majority party and in charge of its agenda. Essentially, because the speaker is supposed to be nonpartisan, the majority leader establishes the goals or top priorities, whether, hey, we're going to go for a tax cut or maybe a tax increase on certain Americans, or maybe um, we're going to push for education reform or whatever it may be. That's the job of the majority leader. The current House majority leader is shown here. It's Steve Scalise. Now, Scalise actually has a really interesting background. Uh, he might be one of the only members of the House or the Senate to have a degree in computer science. Uh, he also minored in political science. He's a native of Louisiana, and prior to becoming involved in politics, he was a member of the Louisiana State Legislature. He was first elected to the House in 2008. Scalise actually was involved in a real tragic incident. In 2017, when the members of the Republican Party were practicing for a Democrat versus Republican baseball game, he was shot by a sniper. He almost died. He actually had to go through several surgeries, but he was able to make it back to Congress and demonstrated that he's really a fighter uh, and it's really kind of a tragedy, uh, but he was able to overcome this uh, and he's now in this leadership position as a Republican in the House of Representatives. Very interesting story with Steve Scalise. As one might guess, after the majority Well, the minority leader does the same thing as the majority leader, just for the other party. So leader of the minority party and in charge of its agenda. The minority leader tries to establish top, top priorities. So if the Democrats are going to try to push for a tax increase on the wealthiest Americans or something along those lines, well, the minority leader would try to say, okay, um, these are the arguments against that or whatever the, pro the party proposes as its top goals. The current House Minority Leader is shown here. His name is Hakeem Jeffries. He was first elected to the House in 2012. Now, interestingly enough, he's one of these other politicians who has a bachelor's degree in political science. So yes, there's something that you can do with one of these degrees. Uh, he also has a master's degree in public policy and he has a JD or a Juris Doctorate or a law degree. Prior to becoming involved in politics, he worked as, a, as an attorney in private practice, and he served in the New York State Legislature. The next position would be the whips. The current majority whip is shown here. His name is Tom Emmer. He's from the state of Minnesota. Again, we see someone with a political science degree and a law degree. He was first elected to the House in 2014. But here's another piece of useless trivia. When he was in college, he was a great hockey player. So he attended both the or Boston College and the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And he played hockey at both schools. 
There are two primary things that WIPs do. First of all, they count votes. They try to determine if a proposal will pass or not, if it will have enough votes. Secondly, they tr if, if it's on the edge, they try to build support and groups of support for bills uh, in order to try to get them passed. Essentially, they try to get members of their party to vote in favor of legislation that leadership supports. Uh, and so often it's their job to say, okay, if you're on the fence on this topic, if you're not sure if you're going to vote for it, what will it take to get your vote? Maybe a proposal needs to be modified a little bit. Uh, and it's the job of the whip to try to get those people on the fence to vote in favor of a, of a particular proposal. Well, here's that map again of the congressional districts in the state of Michigan. I'd like to talk about our representative next. And I think just about everybody uh, who's taking this class would have this person as their representative. Our current United States representative is shown here. His name is John Molinar. He's got an interesting background. He actually has a bachelor's degree in chemistry from Hope. He worked as a chemist for a while, for several years, and then he ended up getting a master's in public administration from Harvard. So his previous occupations were as a chemist, but then he became involved in politics and he was elected to the Michigan State House as well as to the Michigan Senate. He was born in Midland and first elected to the House in 2014. I'm hoping to bring him to West Shore's campus. I just haven't had the chance to get him here yet. I thought I would go ahead and put this one in here. Our former representative who has been in Congress for quite a while was Bill Heisinger. As a result of some redistricting, um, he's no longer our representative, but I did get a chance to bring him to the college several years ago. And so here's a photo of him right on one of those hallways uh, here at West Shore at the Arts and Sciences Building. Well, we've addressed the leadership in the House of Representatives. Let's explore the Senate next. The Constitution identifies a few leadership positions in the Senate. The first would be the President of the Senate. Did you know that there was this position of President of the Senate? Well, the current Senate President is shown here. Do you know her name? It's Kamala Harris. She has another job. The President of the Senate is always the Vice President of the United States. Now, when it comes to voting, the only time the president of the Senate would vote as a senator is to break a 50-50 tie. So the president of the Senate is the vice president of the United States. Because the vice president can't always be there, there's another position identified in the Constitution. That's called the president pro tempore of the Senate. The position occupying this office uh, has a qualification based upon tradition. It's a member of the majority party who's been in the Senate the longest. The current president pro tem of the Senate is shown here. This is Patty Murray. She's a Democrat from the state of Washington. Interestingly enough, she's the first woman to ever hold this position. Prior to becoming involved in politics, she was a teacher. She actually has a bachelor's degree in education from Washington State University, and she became kind of a consumer and, and environmental advocate, and then was elected to the Washington State Senate. She was first elected to the United States Senate in 1992. So I often try to find some unique trivia about some of these elected officials, and I've got a couple things I could say about Patty Murray. So first of all, uh, when she first was running for the United States Senate, one of her critics described her as, you're just a mom in tennis shoes. And in fact, uh, so she actually embraced that label. Uh, and she's like, yes, I am a mom in tennis shoes. Uh, and she began wearing her tennis shoes all the time in public because she was running all over the place and that. Um, and she ended up winning the election. Uh, and she's continued to talk about herself as a mom in tennis shoes. The other thing I wanted to mention is the fact that she was a teacher, then she was eventually a school board member at the Shortline Public Schools outside of Seattle. Well, my mom worked at the Shortline Public Schools. Uh, she was a school nurse, and my mom was on the negotiating team. And Patty Murray was on the board negotiating against my mom. 
Uh, my mom always did have respect for her. So anyway, that's a piece of dumb, useless trivia uh, that's connected to me and to Patty Murray. But I thought that that was actually kind of interesting. Well, I tried to find some unique trivia about a lot of these people, and so I've got a couple things, I guess. Uh, when Patty Murray first became involved in politics, she kept um, she wore like really nice clothing, uh, but she always wore tennis shoes because she was always on the move. So her her phrase that was associated with her campaign was that she was the mom in tennis shoes. The other thing I just wanted to mention is that uh, Patty Murray was a former teacher. Well, she also served as a school board member of the Shoreline School District. Well, my mom worked for the Shoreline School District and in fact uh, she was a school nurse and my mom was on the negotiating team um, against Patty Murray uh, and so it was just kind of interesting um, uh, she was a board member my mom was an employee uh, and so that's just again a dumb piece of useless trivia but kind of interesting I guess in a way uh, concerning Patty Murray. The Constitution identifies those positions of President of the Senate and President Pro Tempore. Well, the way things have actually evolved is that those positions are largely symbolic. There's not a whole lot of power that comes with it. The most powerful position in the U.S. Senate is the office of Majority Leader. Now, I talked about the Majority and Minority Leader in the House. In the Senate, they do the same thing. Essentially, the majority leader and minority leader are the leader of their party in that chamber and in charge of their party's agenda, their goals, the types of legislation that they want to support. Chuck Schumer, shown here, is the current Senate majority leader. He had an interesting background where he grew up in New York. His dad was an exterminator. His mom was a homemaker. He had a perfect score on the SAT. And that enabled him to go to college, and eventually he got a law degree. In the useless information department, one of his cousins is an actress. You may be familiar with her, Amy Schumer. After the majority leader comes, the minority leader. Mitch McConnell is shown here. He's the current Senate minority leader. He grew up in Kentucky, and has lived there his whole life. One thing that I like to talk about with Mitch McConnell is that he's had to overcome things in his past. When he was a boy, he had polio. He suffered from polio and he lost his ability to walk uh, for about a year. And he had to learn how to walk again. And now he's one of the most powerful people in the United States Senate. After the minority leader would come the whips, but there aren't any crucial whips in the Senate, so I'm not gonna identify anyone there. Um, but I did want to identify uh, the unique role of rookie senators. Rookie senators play a unique role in the United States Senate. Um, often they serve as chair for debate. See, debate can go on and on and on in the United States Senate. So they get the job that nobody else wants. They serve as chair. They have to be there. It also leads to one of the unique events in American history. In 1963, the rookie senator from Massachusetts was chairing debate, and then he received a note, and he called debate to a halt, and he said, the president's just been shot. We need to adjourn. Well, this was November of 1963. The president who had just been shot was John Kennedy. That rookie senator from Massachusetts, well, it was Ted Kennedy. So it's one of the ironies of American history and tradition that Ted Kennedy actually had to announce on the floor of the U.S. Senate that his own brother, the president, had been shot. Michigan's senior senator is shown here. She grew up in the Lansing area, then she got a degree in social work, and then became involved in politics. She was first elected in the year 2000. A few years back, Senator Stabenow visited West Shore. Michigan's other senator is Gary Peters. He's got several degrees, one from Alma, another from Wayne State, and one from Michigan State University in philosophy. He was in the Naval Reserve for several years and first elected in 2014. Senator Peters came to Ludington a few years back as well. 
Well, we're just about done, but I'd like to review some of the main ideas from today's presentation. This lecture focused on a comparison and contrast between the House and the Senate in terms of qualifications for serving, constitutional powers, leadership position and how they're organized. What you want to be able to do is you want to be able to evaluate which of these chambers you believe to be the most powerful and most important. Well, that's all for today. Have a great day and we'll talk to you soon online.